All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today on our webinar um, focused on grants, so tips for finding and applying for grants, next steps after being awarded. Um, I'm Jenny Bombach, and I work in the Nutrition Resource Center here at Gordon Food Service, and I'm joined by our guest speaker, Dr. Susie Baxter. So everyone is muted, so if you have any questions, please feel free to just type them into the question panel, and then if time allows at the end, we will answer those, and if not, then we will respond to your questions via email. Um, next slide, please. So I'll just start by introducing Dr. Baxter to you, then she'll present on finding grant resources available to you, best practices when writing, and then next steps after being awarded a grant. And then I will wrap up with introducing a resource available to you from Gordon Food Service. All right, so let's go ahead and learn a little bit about Dr. Susie Baxter. So Dr. Susie Baxter received her bachelor's degree and completed a coordinated undergraduate program at Texas Christian University. She received her master's and PhD from Texas Women's University in Denton and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric nutrition research at the Medical College of Georgia. So she is a registered and licensed dietitian and fellow of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, or simply known as the Academy. So Dr. Baxter is an affiliate research professor at the University of South Carolina as principal investigator on numerous research grants funded mainly by the National Institutes of Health. Her primary research has concerned the accuracy of dietary recalls by children. So she's authored 90 peer-reviewed articles, five chapters, 179 poster or podium presentations, and 84 invited presentations. So Dr. Baxter had to resign her research professor position in late 2016 due to an acquired disability. So she's an active academy member and Dr. Baxter's service includes the South Carolina affiliate as past president, past foundation liaison and current diversity liaison. Um, the academy's cultures of gender and age member interest group as current membership chair. Uh, the Academy's Research Dietetic Practice Group as past treasurer, past diversity liaison, and current mentor. Um, the Academy is a current member of the Board of Editors for the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and past member of the 2017-2019 Diversity Leaders Program. And the Academy Foundation is a current member of the Philanthropy Council, past member and chair of the Scholarship Committee, and past chair of the task force to create the Amy Joy Memorial Research Award. So Dr. Baxter's honors include the 2012 South Carolina Outstanding Dietitian of the Year, 2016 Research Dietetic Practice Group, First Other Publication Award, and 2017 Munson Award for Outstanding Research Literature. So we're very honored and fortunate to have Dr. Baxter with us today to share her knowledge and experience on grants. So I will now go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Baxter. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you everyone who's joined the webinar. I very much appreciate and am honored to be asked to present this webinar, and thank you for joining and listening. So after attending this webinar, you should be able to accomplish the following three objectives. Name two sources of grant funding. Provide two examples of best practices for writing grant applications and specify two best practices for steps to take after grant funding has been awarded. So we'll begin with objective one, which concerns sources of grant funding. And the slides that you'll be seeing will provide the sources along with the URL links. And I understand that after the webinar, you will receive a PDF of the slides so that you'll have these URL links. Now, there are numerous sources of grant funding. Some grant sources are for research and others are for equipment, training, community service, or other purposes. The requirements for the principal investigator of the grant vary according to the grant source, so be sure to check these to make sure that you qualify. Application deadlines can vary drastically, so pay attention to these. Know the various aspects of your grant source before you apply. 
The U.S. Department of Agriculture Food and Nutrition Service is a grant source primarily for equipment assistance, training, and things such as team nutrition. The Academy's Nutrition Research Network conducts, supports, promotes, and advocates for practice-based research to answer questions that are important to dietetics practice. Network members are registered dietitians nutritionists who work in a variety of practice settings and specialties, and they include practitioners, researchers, and students. Membership in this network is open and free to all Academy members. To join the network, you simply email nrn at eatright.org org, with join and your member number in the subject line. And I encourage you to join this network because it emails periodic updates, which include funding fellowship opportunities. For example, in the July 2020 update, the funding fellowship opportunities section provided links to five grant sources. The Academy's foundation has several named funds which support research, and each grant has specific criteria governing its use. The funding ranges from $1,000 to $20,000 for research on topics that includes things such as food service management, dietary assessment methodology, fruit and vegetable gardens, oral or dental health, diabetes medical nutrition therapy, nutrition support, nutrition epidemiology, spices and herbs, and vegetarian nutrition. Now, some of these grants are specifically for doctoral students working on dissertations, but not all of them. However, you must be an Academy member to apply. Other professional organizations are sources of grant funding. One example of these is the School Nutrition Foundation. Proposal Central Grant Database provides an alphabetical list of professional organizations and foundations which fund grants. The National Institutes of Health, or NIH, probably funds the most research grants. It usually requires that the principal investigator have a doctoral degree in the specific area that the grant concerns. The NIH has several types of Funding Opportunity Announcements, or FOAs. A Request for Applications, or RFA, is issued by one or more institute or center to accomplish specific program objectives. The RFA indicates the amount of set-aside funds and the anticipated number of wards, and there usually is a single due date for an RFA. In contrast, a program announcement, or PA, is issued by one or more institutes or centers to highlight areas of scientific interest or encourage applications for a new or ongoing program. A PA uses standard due dates, which are in February, June, and October, and usually runs for three years. And there are two types of program announcements. A PAS has set aside funds, whereas a PAR has a special receipt, referral, and or review considerations. And then a parent announcement allows applicants to submit investigator-initiated applications to the many NIH institutes and centers that participate. Parent announcements use the standard due dates in February, June, and October, and usually last for three years. And it's important to know about these different opportunities. Many people are confused about these and think you have to apply for the RFAs, the request for applications, and that's simply not true. Private foundations fund grants too. Now, some private foundations require you to submit a letter of intent first to briefly describe the project and then you must receive an invitation to submit a full grant proposal. Some private foundations have priority places where they concentrate the majority of their funding. So again, know your funding source before you apply. 
the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funds grants and it requires a letter of intent first and then invites you to submit a full grant proposal. The Nestle Foundation also funds training grants, pilot grants, and full grants, which can be small or large. It requires a letter of intent first and then invites you to submit a full grant proposal. The Kellogg Foundation also funds grants. These grants concern children. Its thriving children priority supports a healthy start and quality learning experience for all children. And a majority of its funding in the United States goes to Michigan, Mississippi, New Mexico, and New Orleans. So now we'll move on to objective two which concerns best practices for writing grant applications. First of all, I encourage you to allow time to think. For me, this meant keeping notepads in several places for whenever I had a thought. <laughs> so I would keep notepads, for example, by the sink in the bathroom, by the bed, and by my recliner in front of the television because this is where I often had ideas for revisions, additions, or deletions. For example, when I was washing my face, brushing my teeth, taking a shower, trying to sleep, or when trying to relax while watching television. I could quickly write a note on the pad to remind myself about the change the next time I was at my computer so that I wouldn't forget it. Have a mentor and be a mentor. Whether you're early in your career, late in your career, or somewhere in between, you'll always have benefits by having a mentor and by being a mentor to talk with about your ideas, your successes, your brick walls, etc. Collaborate. You've probably heard the saying that variety is the spice of life. Well, collaboration is, ne is a necessary spice for your research project. Collaborate with experts in other fields for projects that combine topics, topics for which you lack a formal degree. The National Institutes of Health usually wants not only the principal investigator to have a doctoral degree, but each co-investigator to have a doctoral degree too. For example, if your research project concerns child nutrition and physical activity at school, an application to NIH would usually require a principal investigator with a doctoral degree in nutrition or dietetics, a co-investigator with a doctoral degree in physical activity or exercise, and a co-investigator with a doctoral degree in statistics. As Jenny mentioned, my primary research concerns the accuracy of children's self-reports of diet. So I collaborated primarily with a cognitive psychologist who had expertise concerning memory and with a statistician. 604802. If everyone will make sure that they're on mute, please. I'm hearing somebody talking. Okay, thank you. And another best practice for writing grants is to be sure to include quality control. Quality control is especially important when you have multiple people who are collecting your data and or when your data collection occurs over long periods of days or months. That's because you need to make sure that your data are collected in the same manner, irrespective of who collected the data and regardless of whether the data were collected on day five of year one or on day 155 of year three. Another best practice is to build in time for the unexpected. This concerns your timeline as well as your staffing. You may have inclement weather, close your office, and or the locations where you collect data and thus temporarily halt your project. Or your staff may be unavailable to work for short periods of time or extended periods of time due to maternity leave, jury duty, death in the family, and or medical tragedies. 
over my 25 plus years as principal investigator, supervising research teams, I've experienced all of these and some of them multiple times. And they were all, for the most part, unexpected. Maternity leave, you, you can expect a little bit, but not always, because sometimes suddenly they're put on extended bed rest and you knew that they were going to have extended maternity leave coming up, but you know, if they were put on bed rest all of a sudden in month five of their pregnancy, that was unexpected. Another best practice is what I call providing examples for clarity. In your research plan, you're going to have terms that, confine, that define conditions that are specific to your research. And these are clear to you, but they're going to be new to the reviewers who score your application. And these scores are used to determine funding and whether or not you'll receive funding. So it's important to provide examples in your research plan of your application for clarity. The slide you see now shows something that happened to me in a grant application. The objective for the study was to determine whether school meals and 24-hour recalls provided by fourth grade children were more accurate when the recalls concerned the prior 24 hours instead of the previous day, and when the time of the interview to obtain the 24-hour recall was earlier rather than later of the day. Now, the first submission of the application was not funded. The reviewers were confused by the objective. And their comment was that, well, a 24-hour recall is a 24-hour recall. So what does it matter whether it's the prior 24 hours or the previous day? And what does it matter whether the interview time is morning, afternoon, or evening? So I had to revise the application. And I included a table that's similar to the one shown on the slide to explain the difference. And then the reviewers understood what the difference was. And several grants after this that concerned the accuracy of children's dietary recalls and included a similar table to this one were funded. And I can tell you that to this day, this was the biggest hitter that I had for what impacts the accuracy of children's dietary recalls was when the target period concerns the prior 24 hours rather than the previous day. Another best practice is to, if possible, collect data that can be used for analyses later in future grants. Now, you've heard mentioned earlier in the webinar, the primary purpose in my research concerned the accuracy of children's self-reports of diet. So we observed children eating meals that provided, were provided at school. So that was usually breakfast and lunch. And then we compared the observations of what we saw the children eating to what the children reported they had eaten at these meals during their 24-hour recalls. We collected records of each child's daily participation in school breakfast and lunch, statewide academic achievement test scores, and their school absences. We also measured children's weight and height to determine their body mass index. And we needed these measures for our validation studies, and we correlated them with their dietary recall accuracy. However, for my secondary line of research in later grant applications, I correlated children's daily participation in school meals with their body mass index. This was novel and more accurate because past research had relied on parents' or children's reports of children's participation in school meals, usually in terms of replies simply of yes, no, or usually. Another best practice for writing grants is to obtain pre-submission review. Now this is very helpful because it can help identify weaknesses you need to correct before you submit to the funding source. It's best to have a pre-submission review that's conducted by someone who's familiar with the general subject and who has past experience 
by serving on a review panel for a funding source. However, it's important to never discuss a grant application with a reviewer who is currently serving on a review panel or funding source to which you will submit an application. This is strictly forbidden by the National Institutes of Health. Now keep in mind that often you will need to pay a fee of about $300 for this review, but often your institute has funds set aside for this specific purpose. Now, of course, <clears throat> in order to have a pre-submission review and to make the changes that are needed that are identified this, by this review, you need to have your research plan ready about one or two months before the submission deadline. So you need to be organized to do this, but I do strongly encourage it because it is very helpful. And I have served on numerous grant review panels as both a regular member and as an ad hoc member in the past. And so I'm happy to serve as a pre-submission reviewer for you and or to help you identify a reviewer if the topic of your grant application is something outside of my areas of expertise. Another best practice is to remember that simultaneous deadlines can be deadly because the plural of deadlines is deadliness. You add an extra S to the end of, end of deadlines and you get deadliness. This, here's a true story. I was working on several grant applications simultaneously and I asked my office administrator to email the grants office at my university to give them a heads up about the deadlines for my various applications. She sent the email and copied me on it. She had done spell check, but she had added an extra S to the end of deadlines. And so spell check, of course, did not pick up on it because deadliness is a word. I laughed out loud when I read this email and I showed it to her. However, I also took the typo to heart and I've never forgotten it. Another best practice is that to get funded, you need to submit, revise, and resubmit, and keep trying. If you don't submit, you're not gonna get funded. You may have a great idea for a grant, but it also may need several submissions and revisions to actually get that idea funded. Now, some of your grant sources will provide comments by the reviewers, but some do not. For example, National Institutes of Health, the reviewers do provide comments, but usually foundations, the reviewers do not provide comments. Um, when you do get the comments, try not to take the comments personally. Instead, and always be as responsive as possible to the comments in your revisions. Even if a funding source does not allow you to submit a revised application, you can use the comments if you get them and learn from them and use those to submit a revised application to a different funding source. So in other words, if you think your research idea is a good one and worth funding, then keep working on it, keep improving it, keep revising it, and keep resubmitting it to another funding source. Now, there is a caveat here, and that is that we, when reviewers to a current submission have access to the comments provided by reviewers of the past submissions or past submission, and that's the case with NIH. So that means that you need to decide whether you can provide adequate evidence or rationale to overcome a past negative comment to proceed with it in a revised submission. Because 
the reviewers of your revised submission are going to see those past comments. So if a past negative comment to an application at NIH, if, that, if a past negative comment is so negative that it's going to sink your boat and no amount of evidence or rationale in a, rise, in a revised submission is going to overcome it, then it's best to what I call just ditch that application and begin again. You want to, what, what we call, you want to lose that review. You don't want the current reviewers of your, app, of your new application to see that review and see that negative comment. Now, that does not mean that you're going to forget your whole idea. Instead, it means you select a new title for your application and you revise at least one of your objectives and your sample size enough that your research plan is different than your previous one. And I have experience doing this too. And so I'm happy to help you with it too, if needed. So you see there, there can be several, there can be a fine art to submitting grant applications and getting funded, especially when it comes to NIH, when you're allowed to, re, to revise and resubmit. But you can get funded, and I'm, I'm an example of this. I've submitted many, many, many grant applications, and many of them were revisions. And you, you can get funded, but you have to keep trying. And another best practice is enjoy the journey. Submitting grants, submitting grants is time consuming and it can be stressful if you let it be stressful. But you can also enjoy it if you allow yourself to enjoy it, to take the time and enjoy the journey. Do the best that you can when the application is in your hands. And then when you submit it, leave it to the reviewers to score it. It's in their hands then. It's no longer in your hands. It's a learning process. You learn from it. You do the best that you can, when you can, and then you allow the reviewers to do the rest. So now we'll move on to objective three, which concerns best practices for steps to take after grant funding has been awarded. So first, you want to stay on schedule as much as possible to accomplish the activities that are identified in your project's timeline. Most funding sources require some type of progress report. So you want to know whether your funding source does. And if so, you want to identify when those progress reports are due. And you want to accomplish your activities so that you can report appropriate progress whether it's data collection or manuscript writing or whatever it is. Another step is to hire and manage the best teams possible for the specific project. Now, some funding sources allow you to actually begin your project one to three months before the funding begins. And this can be especially helpful when you need to hire new staff for a project. So you want to know your funding source and discuss this with your institution. Each funding source has its own timeline between when applications are due, when the review panel meets to score applications, when you are notified about the score, and or when you are notified about a funding decision. For example, with NIH, which is an institution that allows the funding to begin allows you to begin your project one to three months before the funding begins. The standing deadlines are February, June, and October. The, the review panels typically meet four or five months after those applications are due and they score the applications. And you can find out your score on the website within a few days of those meetings. And then the council meets a month after the review panels have met. And it's the council who decides whether your application will be funded or not. It's not the review panel. The review panel scores your application, 
but the council decides whether your application will be funded. It looks at the scores and it uses all these other decisions that it has, you know, that the institutes have and the council decides which applications will be funded. So in other words, if you submit, for example, an application to NIH in February, it's reviewed and scored in June or July. The council meets in August to make a funding decision in August. And then the earliest you can begin the project is September. Now the timeline, so that's, that's basically a nine month timeline. You've submitted the application in February, and the earliest you can begin the project is September. Seven-month timeline. It's almost like having a baby, an early baby. The timeline is usually much faster with foundations. And another step is if your research study involves humans, you and your staff must abide by all human policies. On the other hand, if your study involves animals, you and your staff must abide by all animal policies. These policies are crucial to research. And so if you or your staff make a mistake that goes against one of these policies, you must immediately contact the office at your institution for guidance about what to do. Never try to cover it up because that just makes it worse. Another step after funds have been awarded is that I suggest you oversee the budget so that you avoid overspending as well as underspending. Rebudgeting of funds may or not be allowed depending on the funding source and on your institution. You want to be sure to acknowledge the funding mechanism and the funder in your presentations and publications. And you want to be willing to share your successes as well as your failures, because this can help others learn. For example, I've learned that the best way to conduct quality control for 24-hour recall interviews is to audio record each one. This allows any interview to be randomly selected and checked for adherence to the protocol. In contrast, many studies identify specific 24-hour recalls to be checked for adherence to the protocol before the recalls are conducted and then audio record only those specific interviews. Or they may have a supervisor sit in on those randomly selected interviews. But both of these methods give the interviewer advance notice that that specific interview will be checked for adherence to the protocol. And thus they may change the behavior of the interviewer and of the respondent. But with the ability to audio record interviews di digitally and save digital recordings electronically instead of having to save audio tapes, there's really no excuse not to audio record every 24-hour recall, even those conducted by telephone. If my research staff had not been audio recording every 24-hour recall, we would have missed an important problem in one of my studies to test the hypothesis that the accuracy of children's recalls of school breakfast and school lunch obtained during 24-hour recalls would be significantly greater when children were prompted to report meals and snacks in reverse compared to forward order. We had used a similar version of the forward interview protocol in a previous study with fourth grade children. But during numerous practice interviews with the reverse interview protocol prior to actual data collection, children appeared to be able to report their evening meal in reverse order but they had difficulty reporting meals and snacks that they had eaten before their evening meal. And so often interviewers without thinking were responding with something like, you didn't eat or drink anything before that to those children, but not to all children during the reverse interview protocol. 
And that was a problem because this was a methodological study and we need it to be using the same prompts with all children during both the forward interview protocol and then with the reverse interview protocol. So we added a generic prompt of, can you remember any other times yesterday that you had something to eat or drink to the end of the first and the fourth passes for the reverse interview protocol, as well as to the forward interview protocol, so that both protocols utilized similar prompts. And we explain this in the publication for this study and in the presentations. So this ends my part of the webinar, but Jenny has some more information for you about finding and applying for grants. And as she mentioned, um, after that, we should have some time to answer questions that you may have. All right, well, thank you very, very much, Dr. Baxter, for sharing all of your knowledge and your tips and especially all of your personal experiences with us. Um, this has been some very helpful and useful information to hear from you um, when applying for grants, and I know that everyone can benefit from that. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, we've created a toolkit for both healthcare and for K-12 for grant writing. Um, next slide, please. So we developed the grant writing tool to assist you in locating grants and how to plan and organize the process. So both of these versions can be found on Gordon Experience. So if you go to resources and then go to the health and wellness page, they can both be found there. And then the K-12 version can also be found on the Great for Schools page. Um, and then the format for both versions is essentially the same while providing links for the appropriate segments on the two different versions. Um, next slide, please. Maybe just try hitting the space bar. There we go, thank you. Um, so as you can see here, the outline for the tool um, has three different sections. So there's a section for applying for grants, um, for tips, and for additional resources. So under applying for grants, we have learn. So there's information to gain an understanding of the general overview of grants. Um, and then check, so ensure that you are eligible to apply. And then we provide a list of organizations that are gener generally eligible to apply. Um, search, so we provide various grant websites for an overview of available grants that align with your work. And then register, so again, we provide a link to register for the grant if it's posted on grants.gov. And you must register prior to applying. Um, and then apply. So again, we provide an application link that goes to grants.gov and then track. So a link is provided to track the status of your application. Um, and then under the tip section, some general tips that are provided um, include obtain and include a data universal number system number or DUNS. Um, make it easy for peer reviewers to evaluate the proposal. So some things that you can do um, include aligning your application narrative with the selection criteria. Um, be sure that you're clear, concise, specific, and explain any uh, missing information. So by that we mean if they're requiring any specific statistics, maybe if you don't have that available yet, just explain why that's not included in your application. Um, provide accurate and honest information. Um, make certain that the thought process in all parts of the application are uniform. Um, and justify the funding request and just making sure that all that the required material is included and there's a few more tips under there as well. So then under additional resources, we just provide links to additional resources such as grants.gov and grant life cycle management sites and systems. So I do apologize, this is kind of blurry to see, but like I said, these are both available on Gordon Experience, so you can go there at any time to find um, either the healthcare or the education version. 
All right, next slide, please. Okay, so that is the end. So let me just take a look real quick and see which questions have come in throughout the webinar. Okay, so this one um, is directed for you, Dr. Baxter, and this says, are you able to submit the application to multiple sources? And if so, and both are awarded, can you accept funding from both? Ah, that is, that is an excellent question. Yes, you are able to submit an application to multiple sources simultaneously. However, you are not allowed to accept funding for the same grant simultaneously. If you are fortunate enough to have the same grant funded by more than one source, you have to report it to both sources. And this actually happened to me one time. And then what you have to do is talk with both of them and with uh, hopefully one of them will allow you to change the objectives, you, you know, to keep the funding, but to tweak the objectives. And so then you can still keep the funding, but slightly alter the objectives. And so I actually did this um, when I submitted the same grant to USDA and to NIH. And um, we were going to look at what we had submitted was to look at um, sources of intrusions. So, excuse me, what we submitted was to look at examining dietary recall accuracy for energy and macronutrients using both conventional variables and reporting error sensitive variables. We submitted that to both USDA and NIH and both of them funded it. So I went to NIH and they said, well, can you give us some other, another set of objectives that would be, you know, similar. And so what we submitted to them was to look at, um, research to examine the sources or the in origins of intrusions, the phantom foods or falsely reported items in children's dietary recalls. So both of these were secondary analyses using the data that we had collected previously um, from fourth graders in several studies where we used observations of school breakfast and school lunch and then the children's dietary recalls and um, but we were able to keep the funding from both of them um, so that that is an excellent question so yes you can submit to multiple sources but you are not allowed to receive funding for the same grant from multiple sources okay great thank you so much for providing that detailed response to that question um, so that wraps up our webinar for today. Thank you so much again for joining us and a big thank you again to you, Dr. Baxter, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with everybody. Um, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.